Thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. In this video, I want to show how to use a simple shop made router lathe to turn very accurate wooden tubes or cylinders from a hollow blank of wood. I'll start the process by showing how, for this project, I created a very accurate hexagonal wooden tube that serves as the blank. Then I'll go into the thoughts and process for creating a simple but remarkably accurate router lathe. And then I'll finish up by showing the router lathe in action. It's actually pretty cool to see how the lathe is powered by a cordless drill and makes the cut by simply using a router with a special bit. So, like I said, thanks for tuning in. Let's get it. I gotta confess, I've had a bit of difficulty getting this video shot and cut and produced. So I shot this little sequence to segue between the introduction and the actual start of the work building the hexagonal cylinder. So what you see here is a screen capture showing the SketchUp model I made to design and plan this project. The screen capture starts out with the photo match feature of SketchUp where I've superimposed the model for this table and a seating area that's going to go into a room and someone's home. You can see that the table has round legs. Then by closing layers, I can remove the tabletop where you can see the round legs that I needed to build to create this table. I shot video while I was creating the hexagonal cylinder slats, but the narrative that goes with the video is kind of off. And I hope this explains that awkwardness. But what you'll see is the process I used for creating this hexagonal cylinder. And then this is the first of two of the round cylinders that I'm making for those unusual legs on the table. So I hope you can bear with me and follow along as we go through the process of making the hexagonal cylinder, building the router lathe, and putting it to use to make the round legs for the table you see in the SketchUp model. To make round legs for the current table project I'm working on, I decided to begin with a hexagonal hollow tube, which I will mount into a router lathe fixture that I built to turn them from a hexagon to a four inch diameter tube. Each hexagon is made up of a series of six slats. And I've marked them here with this triangle so that I get these in the right order when they're rolled up into the hexagon tube. The slats are absolutely consistent in width and length and the 30 degree angle on each side is precise so that all the glue joints come together nicely when it's glued. In each one of the slats, I've made very accurate bevels, and then each slat has two biscuit joints in each side of it. These are put very near the short angle of the miter so that when the hexagon is turned to a cylinder, it doesn't cut into those biscuits. The biscuits are a great help when it comes to clamping because they easily keep these slats aligned as the clamping pressure is increased. I also rabbited a small shoulder in each end of each slat. The small rabbit was done on a table saw to produce a consistent depth of rabbit on each piece so that when the hexagon is glued up, there's a small but definite shoulder going around the inside of each end of the tube. I think you can see it there in the camera. That shoulder will allow me to bolt in a hub on each end of the tube, but I determined it was a lot more straightforward to put the rabbit in each piece before the glue up. I'm using these Merle adjustable clamps for this procedure. The clamps come with one fixed jaw and three interchangeable jaws, but because this is a hexagon, I borrowed two of the interchangeable jaws from another clamp so that I have six jaws for the clamping process. The design and capability of this clamp for this type of project is absolutely unbelievable with a huge amount of clamping pressure that can be applied equally and evenly around this hexagon. I borrowed three of these clamps from my good friend at Legacy Construction and the next time I need to do one of these projects 
I am going to go buy a set of my own. These things are fantastic. The biscuit joints that I put in the slats keeps the points of the miter aligned perfectly as that clamping pressure is applied. The glue up is kind of a messy project, but that can't be helped. When I get started, I elevate all the pieces, keeping them in order. And that will help keep the glue from smearing so much. I'm using Type Bond 3 glue, which is my favorite for this type of project. It's a little thinner than some of the carpenter's wood glues, and when it's dry, it tends not to swell out of the joint with changes in humidity and temperature. Gluing up the first hexagon, I realized that it's the simplest to glue up two three-sided halves and then put those together. Put a liberal coat of glue on there. And then work the joint together to make sure I'm getting a nice full joint when the glue oozes out. Since these biscuits are primarily for alignment, I'm not too concerned about making sure that the biscuits are well coated with glue. The main concern here is making sure the ends are perfectly flush. Some people would use a rolling glue bottle for applying the glue. I'm satisfied just letting the glue squeeze itself into a uniform layer. Because the inside of the tube will never show, I'm not worried about extra glue in here. I just want to make sure I have good squeeze out on the outside. I'm just making sure that there's a thorough coat of glue on that whole face because once the clamping pressure is applied it brings those faces together perfectly. This is where those biscuit joints really shine because it keeps this whole assembly organized as I work through this process of preliminary cleanup. It's a warm day out. It's cool enough that I've got some time to work with this before the, this Type Bond 3 glue grabs too firmly to be able to clamp it. In this case I had found actually that it's real handy to just balance this tube on the floor. The clamp has a crude adjustment here by pulling the strap through. But I've got plenty of travel on this screw from my first glue up that I'll be able to get enough pressure and not run out of screw threads down here. Just doing a final check to make sure the ends of everything is flush. Put the screws to it. 
this screw here, or this clamp here, make sure that the band is tight so that the pressure clamps the tube and doesn't just pull the strap. There's a lot of tension on that. You can see nice even glue squeeze out all the way around. I'll zoom in as I apply this second clamp. You can see all these little pivoting jaws that need to line up. A little slack in the clamp. As many pieces and parts as there are here, this actually is quite easy to install. But I want to space these clamps out in three even angles around the tube as I go. And even at that, that's not very, very difficult to manage all that. Here again, um, as I put the clamping pressure on, the joints come together and the biscuits keep everything lined up so I don't end up with a, a skewed end profile. It's staying a perfectly true hexagon. And that is a lot of pressure, doing an excellent job with very little effort. Flip this over for the last clamp. Third verse, same as the first two. Line everything up. And apply some pressure. You see the glue start to squeeze out. And again, the amount of time, the amount of time that I've spent since applying the glue till now is short enough in these weather conditions that that glue hasn't gotten firm yet. So I'm still getting excellent, clean, excellent squeeze out and nice tight miters. Once that's all tightened up, I can go in with a sharp putty knife and clean out the squeeze out from the ends of this inner hexagon so that the hub I use for mounting this in the router lathe will slide smoothly and accurately down into this rabbited recess. Clean up while the glue is wet like this is quick and effective. And since I don't have to worry about finishing or staining inside the tube, it's more than good enough. But I wouldn't want to try to get a clean job of this after that glue got very stiff. Glue's starting to skin up a little bit, but I'm almost done. And here's a pro tip for you from the Next Level Carpentry Shop. Instead of using rags and warm water to wipe up this glue, grab a little bit of fine sawdust and it just mops it right up. I use a fine consistency sawdust that comes out of the bag on my miter box. Works like a charm. And any little bits of glue that dried on come off of that wax for mica like something. Once I've got the important inner edges cleaned up, I'll spend a little time cleaning up some of the extra squeeze out on the outside of the tube before the glue sets up too firmly. At this stage, it comes off in strings and globs rather than hard chunks. The way that the Merle clamps fit on this hexagon tube, space between these padded jaws keeps the glue squeeze out from getting stuck to those jaws. So that glue is easily scraped off later when the clamps are removed and it doesn't make such a mess out of my buddy's tools. If the inside of this tube needed to be cleaned up, I'd make a special scraper to run through and clean up that glue squeeze out in the inside. But as it is, that little fillet of glue isn't going to hurt anything and actually add a little strength to the finished cylinder. After a few hours in the clamps, this thing's all dried up. Solid as can be. And after a little bit of cleanup, it's ready to fit the hubs and put on the lathe.
started by ripping a couple blocks that fit snugly into the recess and can stop on the rabbited shoulder inside the tube. Put a center mark on each of the blocks and use the center mark as a guide for cutting these hubs to size. To trim one face by just a few thousandths of an inch, I lower the blade, slide the block in until it touches the face of the blade length, and then raise it up. And in the process, the amount I shave off the block is the difference between the face of the blade length and the edge of the carbide tooth. It's a great way to instantly gauge that small amount to trim. Technically speaking, it equals one frog's hair. And with that, I get a nice snug fit of the hub inside the hexagon. I get a nice press fit with the second hub and mark it to index as well. Using a straight edge to connect the points on the hexagon I can locate the precise center of this hub. Looking closely, you can see that my initial mark was off by a skosh. I'll mark the exact center with a punch. Using Using a 31 64 inch brad point bit, drill a nice clean straight hole through each of the blocks so that they fit snugly on this half inch threaded rod axle. The rod fits a little too snug in these blocks. And I don't want to go to the next bigger size drill bit. I just chuck the half inch rod in a drill. That reaming process fits this exact piece of rod to that block of wood. With a few whisks of a plane, I'm going to taper this plug this direction a little bit so it still fits snug, but then it won't jam down tight into the end of the tube. Now when I line up my index mark, which is an X with a circle around it, the plug fits nicely in the recess. After planing the other block, I get a similar fit. With the end plugs fit and drilled, I can slide the axle through the blank. Sweet. Now that I've given you an idea of how to make this hexagonal cylinder, I want to talk about the router lathe itself, which is what I use to turn this hexagon into a cylinder. I already gave this process a run through when I made the first cylinder, so now I'm going to talk about the router lathe itself, things to think of when you're planning and making one, and then I'll show how it looks in action. The router lathe itself is pretty simple in concept, but it is important to make the various components very accurate because the end result is only going to be as accurate as the components that go into it. I'm sure it'll come up in the comments, so I'll just go ahead and address it now. I'd love to have a lathe in my shop. I really don't have room. I don't have enough call for the work to justify the expense of the lathe itself and a place to park it here. And I have a friend that's got a great powermatic lathe. I can go over to his shop anytime and use it, but frankly, with little to no experience on a lathe, I don't think I could get a cylinder to turn out this well. So that's why I decided to keep the project in-house, make this simple and accurate router lathe, and get the job done. So you can see here, this is what the lathe looks like when it's done. Basically, I've got 
two, two guide rails. I made these out of white oak, which I happen to have around. One edge of each of these pieces is joined arrow straight on the joiner. And when I assemble the jig, I leave just the frog's hair more than three quarters of an inch space between the two boards so that the bearing on this top bearing router bit fits between the two boards with just enough clearance to get the router bit in and out, but not so much that the bit can chatter and wobble back and forth. When I first built and started using the lathe, I didn't have any support blocks in there. And this oak was deflecting maybe a 64th, maybe a 32nd of an inch as I was applying pressure. So I added a couple of support blocks underneath just to make sure that there's no deflection in these. I built this jig for those legs. They needed to end up at 32 inches. I made them about 34. If a person was doing a shorter project, the support blocks wouldn't be necessary. But I think that this process and this method, I would be comfortable, a little nervous, but comfortable making a tube that was six or even eight feet long with this process. But I'd probably add additional support blocks just to make sure everything was true and parallel between the bed and these guide rails. So the rails are supported by a couple of end blocks. And the end blocks serve as the hubs for this half inch threaded rod to spin in. Because I'm only making two legs, I used yellow pine for these blocks and a piece of threaded rod for the axle. No bearing, just a precise hole in the wood. And that's been fine. If a person was going into production, I'd recommend putting in some sort of a bushing that could get some lubrication and support. Otherwise, the shaft would wallow out the holes over time and start to affect the quality of the finished product. The piece of half inch threaded rod I used was just something I had laying around. It's got a little kink in one end. And so if I was starting this whole thing over, I'd go out and buy a brand new piece of ungalvanized threaded rod, maybe from a machine shop so that it was more accurate. And I would have to do a little less compensating in the setup. These are the hubs that we made for fitting in the hexagon. They just slide over the axle. And even though this rod has a little bit of a whoopee in it, as long as these end blocks are spaced so that there's, oh, an inch or two on each end, then that wobble is so small it doesn't affect anything. If I was putting a shorter workpiece in the middle of this, then the whole system would start to break down because of the flex in the rod. But like I said, as long as these hubs are right near the ends, they're completely stable and do a great job during the turning process. These end blocks I machined out of a two by eight, I guess, but I jointed a face, thickness plane to face, and squared it up so this block is true and square and flat on every side. If there was any cup or warp or twist, those things would start to throw off the accuracy of the jig. So flat and true and square components are essential. When making these blocks, I lined them up and stacked them up and drilled the hole through both blocks at the same time with the same drill bit. I used a 31 64 inch drill bit to make the hole ever so slightly snug on that half inch rod. I have orientation marks on the blocks so that they're lined up on the fixture in the same way they were drilled to maintain the accuracy of that drilled hole. And just to be thorough, I'll mention that the center lines of these blocks are all lined up on this piece so that Everything is true and parallel. The blocks are the same height, and that keeps all the tolerances consistent. I learned on the first go around that a little bit of lubricant in the hole in this wood wouldn't hurt, so I'll put a dab of grease in there for this setup. I use regular half inch nuts on this rod. If I was going into production, making a bunch of these, I would incorporate nylock nuts on here so that things didn't move around. In this limited production case, I just use a piece of masking tape to hold the nuts in place once they're snug down. You'll see how that looks when I mount the blank into this lathe. So I hope I've covered enough of the details here so that that all makes sense. Another important thing about the setup of the lathe is knowing the length of the workpiece so that you can space these blocks to leave about an inch or an inch and a half on each side. That allows room for wrenches to get in to tighten up the axle on the hubs. And also the height from the center of the axle to the bottom of these boards. You want to keep the boards as close to the workpiece size as possible because the farther out of the router the bit is extended, the more likely it is to chatter. I could have reduced the height of these end blocks by a quarter or three eighths of an inch, and I'll keep that in mind when I build the next one of these. I keep getting distracted because I have a visitor at the shop. You got to see this. Hey, little fella. What are you doing today, huh? Yeah, there's a little fawn that stopped by to visit. 
her mom comes around pretty much on a daily basis. Come check out what's going on in the next level carpentry shop. And here's a curious little baby from this year. Just stopping by to say hi. Huh. All right, back to work. Just one of the perks of living in the country. All right, well, it's time to get this blank mounted in the router lathe. And the first step is to insert the hubs into the ends. That's the kind of fit I want. It slides in snug, doesn't wiggle, but I don't have to pound it in or out. Next thing is to slide the threaded rod through those holes. And I've pre-planned this so that this nut ends up inside the block and there'll be just enough axle on this side for the chuck of the cordless drill to hook on here. If there's any goo or burrs in this threaded rod, I use the wire wheel on a bench grinder and then, and then I follow up with the number 13 count side on this thread chasing file to make sure that the nuts spin on there nicely. As an entry into the you learn something new in the everyday journal, I'm having trouble getting that rod to slide through that hole. So I'm taking a, a small countersink bit and I'll crease the target size a little bit. That did it. It spins on there pretty well after using the thread chaser file on that rod. Snugging that down. And this is where the shoulder inside the ends of the tube takes effect because I can tighten this down pulling those hubs into that shoulder. If there was no shoulder there, I'd have to put something inside to keep the blank stable on the rod. Got ahead of myself. I wanted to put a little bit of lube in here. And rather than use oil, I'm just gonna use some wax lube stick stuff, which won't soak into the wood so much. And that way, if we get carried away and start working really hard, it won't start to smoke. I'm adding another washer and nut on here, actually a nut and then a washer. And that combination will stabilize the blank between the blocks so it doesn't shift end to end during the turning process. Making sure I have my orientation right for these blocks. Slide that back in. When I put the fixture together the first time, I put index marks here so that I know exactly where this block needs to end up so it screws from underneath will hold it in place. Those are pre-drilled pilot hold screws. So it indexes everything just like I want it. Here again, I'm centering the blank between the end blocks so that the router bit has a place to park during height changes, etc. Don't want it to start right on top of the wood, which could make a mess. I put one more dab of lube on the inside of that washer. Now the nut's gonna go on 
a little tougher because of all that wonderful wax I put on there. I want a little bit of play in here so that nothing binds up, but not so much that this wobbles back and forth. Like I said, if I was doing more of these, I would use nylock nuts on here and avoid this step, but a piece of masking tape will work just fine for this application. And with all those steps done, you can see how smoothly and easily that turns. There's no wobble in the blank, even though if you watch this end of the rod, you can see it's bouncing up and down. I've eliminated that wobble out of the fixture by mounting the hubs close to these end blocks. But in a perfect world, I'd have a straighter axle, possibly even a 5 8 or 3 quarter inch diameter. But the fixture is built to eliminate the effects of any of that discrepancy. The next step is to install these guide rails. And I'm careful to use the exact same center line as the rest of the fixture to line this up. I'm offsetting 3 8 plus a frog hair off of each side to allow room for the guide bearing on the router bit. Because this is the second turning in here, I've got pre-drilled holes, everything lines up. When doing it the first time, of course, I was careful to line things up and pilot hole everything accurately. But basically, I just want enough room for this router bit and a little bit more. That should be just right. There's enough room between the bottom of the rails and the points on the hexagon to allow clearance. But as I said, I could have shortened these end blocks by, oh, 5 sixteenths or 3 eighths of an inch to get the initial cut closer to the blank because ultimately the four inch diameter is gonna be at this level, which means the router bit is gonna be extended down quite a ways out of the router to make that cut. I left it like this in the video so you can see the margins that you can use and still have a successful end result. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that it required a special bit to make this process work. And what I discovered was I started out by using a straight cut bit. This was a CMT bit. I put a top bearing on it and went to work. And I couldn't believe it, but the spinning action of the cylinder somehow had enough force to actually break the carbide tips of this bit, virtually destroying it. So I switched to another bit, approached it a little different, a much slower feed rate, which didn't break the tips on this bit. This is a white side bit, but I was surprised that the minimal amount of chattering there was, was enough to leave an unacceptably rough texture on the cylinder. So I went to this, which is a, a white side bowl cutting bit. It's got rounded corners, but a flush cutting bottom. And this proved to be ideal for the project. I'll link to this in the description of the video. I'll also have a link to the thread chaser file and any other tools that you see in this video so you'll know which ones I'm talking about. The last component for this router lathe was the support blocks I made. They're just, they're exactly the height of the end blocks. I just slipped them in the middle here to take any deflection out of these pieces and keep the cut parallel to the center line of the blank. So I hope I've given enough information about this. I didn't go into the particulars of making each piece. I could do that at some point, but I think that the process is clear. Make sure that all your materials are flat, true square, accurate, and straight, and pay attention to center lines and layouts. And this same process could be adapted to all sorts of things. If I were to make a smaller cylinder, I would start out with a more solid blank with just a true hole going through it. That would be another process for another time but that could be done extremely accurately with very little effort. A bigger cylinder could be made. I wouldn't be afraid to make a cylinder that was 12 inches in diameter. I might use a larger axle, like a piece of two inch pipe or something with a chuck on the end to hook up to the drill. Another great feature, which I saw mentioned in another video of a, a more rudimentary router lathe. There was a comment in that video about making the axle so that it wasn't parallel to the rails. And a person could cut a tapered cylinder with that arrangement. I thought that was intriguing. So there's all kinds of latitude in the design and the results. So I hope I've taught the principles and thought process that I used here 
so that you can extrapolate and adapt those to all sorts of projects. I've chucked up that white side router bit in my favorite router for this application, which is a D-handled Bosch. You're going to want to use the router you're most comfortable with and most used to using for this operation. I've extended the bit down. I think you can see here I extended the bit down, so it's just going to take about an eighth of an inch off the long points of this blank as it spins around. And I think you can see here the importance of leaving space between the end of the cylinder and the router bit so that I can set the router bit in, start the router, start the cylinder turning, and then move the router into the work instead of having to try to get both of those things done at once. I personally don't use a plunge router much, but I suppose a person that's used to using one could easily set a plunge depth and do this part of it just a little bit different. So everything's in place to get started on turning this blank into a cylinder. A couple final notes. I'm setting the router up starting at this end because the router bit spins this direction. So it's cutting this way. I have the drill set up to spin the blank this way because I want the bit and the blank to be spinning against each other. I hope that makes sense. When I first started this, I started from this side with the feed rate, the router bit and the drill were going in the same direction. And so the cutting action of the router accelerated the speed of the blank. That got a little nuts. So depending on your setup, which end the drill is on, if it's going forward or backwards, keep all that stuff in mind. But the point is to make sure that the spinning action of the cylinder and the router cutting action are going in opposite directions. Kind of like that. So I'm starting the router on this end. I can fire up the router a bit. The bit's not touching anything. Once the cylinder's spinning, I can move the bit into the work. I've clamped the setup down. Depending on your shop setup, you might screw this down or anchor it some other way, but I want it to be stationary. And I've got the drill chucked on to spin this cylinder. Experimenting in previous work with this jig, I've found that a very simple but somewhat crude method works really well for setting the speed. So I just, piece of sturdy tape, pull the trigger, find the speed I like for the spinning blank, and then just use the battery as an on and off switch to turn on my lathe. And I know I keep saying this, but if I was doing something in production, I had to do more of these, I'd come up with a better system for this as well as a couple other things. But the way it is, I just got a kick out of how well this whole thing works with how little is involved. Well, that's a whole lot of information on how to get to this stage for this process, which is actually what the whole point of the video is, how to use a router lathe to turn a cylinder. So I think it's time to get to work. I'm gonna get this jig fired up and working, and why don't you go ahead and explain to the viewers what's going on here. So to make this process work, all he needs to do is plug in the battery to spin the, the drum, and then fire up the router and ease it into the work. Just going slowly, because it's taking the nibs off that hexagonal cylinder on the first pass, taking about an eighth of an inch at a time. It takes a little getting used to. Every situation is going to be a little bit different. I want to approach with caution. I'm using a fair amount of pressure to keep the router from tearing itself into the work. Almost like climb cutting, it can grab and take off into the work. So I'm using a lot of resistance to keep a nice, even, slow feed rate as I make the pass across. You can tell by the sound that each successive pass is getting a little smoother. The flat spots on the cylinder are getting narrower each pass. It's a little easier to keep things under control when it's not just knocking off those high points. But you can see, even though that these are still cutting passes and, and not a finished pass, that white side router bit is doing a really nice job of giving us a smooth surface on the cylinder. I 
I think this is about the sixth pass that I'll be making, just about down to the point now where it'll be cutting the full circle. I'm going to take the speed of the drill up just slightly for a smoother finish. After seven or eight passes, incrementally dropping the bit, I've got the cylinder turned to where there's just a little remnant or two of the pencil lines, and there's a little bit of uh, irregularity in the cut because, uh, as you'll see if you try this, the router really wants to grab and pull forward into the work. I'm not pushing the router at all. I'm constantly putting on the brakes to even the feed rate. So I'm going to take one more whisker off the whole thing in one final pass of like a 64th of an inch with a real slow feed rate to get it nice and true where I'll be able to pick it up from there with a sanding block to put the final smooth pass on this turning. I sped the drill up a notch again just for that nice smooth final pass. And I'm sure he's going to tell you it'd be easy to get impatient right at the end because this final pass makes everything look so smooth. You just get anxious to get it done. But take time on that final pass, get a nice, even, consistent feed rate, and that makes the sanding process that much quicker, easier, and the final product that much better. I think I heard him saying, don't get anxious at the end. Be patient and make that final pass nice and smooth so that the sanding process is quicker and the end result is better. Did you already say that? I thought so. After that final pass, cordless drill battery is going dead. And I think you can see how consistent the cut on that cylinder is, even though that axle itself has kind of got a wobble to it at the end. So without shooting a video, what would that have taken? Uh, I don't know, probably half an hour, 45 minutes to do, carefully taking down each pass at a time. What do you think? Sounds about right, doesn't it? So that gives you a pretty good idea of the process of setting up the router lathe and using it to turn the cylinder. I'll shoot a little video uh, of sanding the cylinder down before I take it back out of the jig as a finished product. I'm good with that. What about you? Well, I'd say you did a great job on it. Uh, I got sawdust all over me somehow, but hey, it's a small price to pay for that kind of result. Why don't I go ahead and take this apart and get the sanding done, and then you can explain what's going on in the video. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. You go right ahead and take care of that. I think you got it handled. I'll just hang out over here, or maybe I'll go grab a soda. What do you think of my high-tech desk collection system, huh? Are you going to start out with the 100 grit belt on the block again this time like you did before? Yeah, I think I'll do that. A fresh 100 grit belt on a rigid sanding block is perfect for removing the slight chatter marks that show up from the routering process. The trick of using masking tape on the trigger of that cordless drill is a great way to regulate the speed of the drum, get a good speed for an efficient cut and a smooth finish.
As you can see, it doesn't take much effort at all to get this cylinder trued up and smooth as can be. So now I'll move on to 150 grit sandpaper to get it one step closer to being ready for that final finish. Wow, what's going on there? You got some kind of a wobble going on in that thing. Better do something about that. I couldn't figure out why this thing got such a terrible shimmy in it there in that last little section, but... My lock nut system failed me once again and the cylinder was just freewheeling on that axle. That's more like it. So you can see with this cylinder turning at slow speed, you can probably hear the sound of my hand rubbing on there. That thing is just smooth and straight. So I'm quite pleased with the way that whole process works. Well, congratulations if you made it all the way through to the end of this video. There was a lot of information there. I hope you find it useful. I especially appreciate the patience of subscribers who wait months on end for new videos to come out on Next Level Carpentry. It just takes a long time to shoot the video, plan the project out, edit it, and then get it uploaded for you to see. So thanks for hanging in there with me. And thanks from both of us for tuning in to Next Level Carpentry, subscribing to the channel, and posting comments.